Golfie with Remax, the Golfie team. Welcome to the Golfie Real Estate Show, Hamilton Edition with host Rick Zamprin. Yeah, and Easter long weekend edition. Happy Easter to one and all who are listening here on 900 CHML. Rick Zamprin. And, and first off the hop, yeah, it is Easter weekend, but your phone is never that far away, is it? Never. My phone is always on. I think the only day I really don't... Um, um, really like if a phone call happens, unless it's somebody like friends, family or anything like that is Christmas day. Yeah. But I, my phone is on all morning till night, seven days a week. <laughs> and, uh, probably, and it's only one day a year that I probably put my phone aside. I don't even look at it and it's, th that's Christmas day, but I, but Easter weekend. Yeah. Like I, I will have my uh, phone. If somebody's calling, uh, in regards to buying or selling a house, I'm there. And and you know what? And if you take this job on as a realtor, th that's part of the job. That's that's what the yeah. you know like there's the oath. Like and, and some you know what I mean. Like like when you, people houses come up for sale all different times, and and people want to get in, and and you got to accommodate trying to and a family's trying to find a home for their family. Um, you got to try to get them in there and try to put the deal together. And, um, and sometimes, you know, some, some realtors, maybe they don't, uh, work, uh, certain days and, and they lose out on, on certain deals. And, and those clients there sometimes will say, you know what, I'm, I, I got to find somebody that wants to work. And, uh, um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm working. I work uh, all the time every weekend and, uh, the phone's always there. So if somebody needs to get a hold of me, just give me a call. <laughs> Is is I've always wondered this: Is the week after Easter weekend a busy week for you and other realtors? Because we know that family and and in many cases friends are getting together, and they might talk about, "Hey, would you ever consider selling this house?" Or you know, the, what do you think about the market? And and I'm just picturing a lot of people calling the golfy team at nine zero five five seven five seventy seven hundred after they're having these conversations at the you know the Easter dinner table. And then they're like, you know what? Yeah, we should call the golfy team. Is, is the week after Easter very busy? Yeah, usually that's the kickoff for a lot of times of the of the, of the spring market. Um, and 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 the thing is, that the funny thing is, it, it it's hard to gauge. Sometimes it's really quiet the Easter weekend, and then it picks up, mm -hmm. or it could be vice versa. So if if you're basically wanting to hold offers, I would probably not do it on an Easter weekend, uh, just because like. People may not be looking at, at the real estate, you know, they're with family and they're doing stuff. And you may lose a percentage of the population that is looking for a house. And and mm -hmm. that could hurt you on getting more money for your house. Now, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. It's hard to gauge. Um, I had one agent uh, on my team said, hey, Rob, uh, uh, we, we're going to hold offers. We're going to put the house on the market Friday. I said, nope. Do it next week. I go, if you put the house on the market on Friday, it's a, it's a long weekend. It's a holiday. People aren't going to be looking at their phones for real estate as much on Friday as they would be on, on you know, mid, mid early to midweek. And uh, and then you're going to lose a huge uh, percentage of people that are looking because they're maybe they're taking a break and they're visiting family. They can't look at houses. And if it sells, you may sell the house. And it sells, you know, for a decent price, but you could have got maybe a better price if you had more people interested in looking at it. So, yeah, you, you, you really got to think about that. So we actually held one house off uh, to go on the market on Wednesday uh, this coming week versus, uh, uh, you know, putting it on uh, Friday, Thursday or Friday of this past week. So, you know what, it, it's, there's all strategies. And and it and you have to gauge it, but to play it safe, it's always play to play it safe during uh, when there's no holidays or anything like that. So it's hard you don't know if it's going to be a good holiday or a bad holiday for uh, showings or not. Earlier this week, you celebrated with some of your top agents. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so I I took um, uh, we have uh, you know uh, uh, top agents that produced uh, really well, and I took them out for dinner at the uh, Hamilton Club here in Hamilton. And uh, it was a great, great night event. And uh, uh, we, uh, you know, did, you know, just giving them, uh, you know, just a nice pat on the back saying, hey, you know, great uh, job that they've done and, uh, uh, and everything. And uh, they were really happy about that. It was a great dinner. It was a, a great night. And uh, yeah, we, pr we closed the place down uh, on uh, Wednesday night. And then, and then <laughs> we do have our awards uh, 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 evening that's happening next, uh, next weekend. 
And uh, that is like like the Oscars of uh, the golfies. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that. It's a Friday night. So uh, there'll be some uh, lot, lots of good food, lots of, uh, um, you know, dancing and stuff like that. So we're, we, we're making a big, nice evening of it. So looking forward to it. I, I remember seeing that on social media last year. I think it's just called the golfies, yes, the awards it, themselves. Yes, it is called the golfies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah everybody's yeah. looking forward to it. Everybody gets dressed up and, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's a great night out. Everybody, you know, the team, you know, now everybody's all together in a big room and, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, we have team members that uh, live in Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, well in Fort Erie, right through into, you know, Stony Creek, Hamilton, Burlington, Brantford, all, all around. So we, so everybody's together and we all see each other every week on Zoom. And then we have every quarterly we meet, we see each other, you know, uh, we have an in, uh, in-person meeting with everybody. Uh, our next in-person meeting actually is going to be fantastic. We're holding at a movie theater. And uh, so we rented, oh, wow. yeah, we rented the movie theater so everybody could be sitting in their movie, uh, movie theater chairs and they can look down and, and, uh, and we have the big screen to show slides and stuff like that. And we, we've got some food coming. So everybody's looking forward to that. So we always try to do something different to, you know, keep uh, the agents, uh, you know, uh, interested and, and uh, you know, to come out. So it's, uh, it's, we're looking forward to that, that our quarterly uh, meeting at the movie theater. Right, the team building sessions, that is for sure. Let's talk about the current state of the local real estate market. What are you, you have your finger on the pulse. What are you noticing? Yeah, so, okay, so now the real estate board comes out uh, with average sale price. I come out with yep. be benchmark price. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go through. So in Hamilton, the average sale price kind of dropped a little bit in March versus uh, February, but now, but, but it, it, uh, in, that's in Hamilton. Now, Hamilton dropped 3% benchmark price. So the benchmark price in February uh, of, of this year was 670000 So, But it dropped down to 652000 uh, in March. So, so February was a great month to buy, uh, to sell real estate, as I always said. Now, uh, Burlington was up 2% benchmark price from February to, uh, to March. And then Brantford jumped 4%. Uh, and uh, St. Catharines dropped uh, 3% uh, from uh, February to Mar uh, March, dropped 3%. Niagara Falls up 4% uh, uh, from February, and uh, Welland dropped 5%. Oakville up 5%. And Toronto, benchmark price, down 2%. So I, I know when they average, uh, mark the, uh, the, uh, the time uh, of, of what the average sale price is, it, they throw a lot of high-end properties in there, which kind of offsets the price. But I know we're running out of time, so we got to go into the next uh, segment, right? No, no, we still have some time. we got about oh, four minutes or so. But oh, the, yeah, the, these numbers are very interesting. Yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, no, and, uh, and it, the benchmark price is the real price. You eliminate some of the high-end properties, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the high-end, there's more high-end properties selling now because last year it cooled down so much for these high-end properties they were trying to sell, they couldn't sell them. But the uh, but but we know year over year um, it it is down quite a bit. Uh, for instance, like if you look in proper Hamilton, that we're talking east, west, uh, and central in the mountain, uh, down 19 percent. So last year in Hamilton, can you believe this? The average uh, sale price in March of last year was 805500 This year, it's 652500 Now, wow. yeah, it's just, it, it, that's down like 19%. Now, you go to uh, Burlington, down 20%. The average sale price in March uh, last year was $1.2 million. Now, it's, uh, now, March of 2023, 966000 So, down 20%. Uh, benchmark price. Oakville's down 14%. Uh, Brantford down 18%. So last year, Brantford in, in March was 760000 This year, it's 625000 uh, So that went down quite a bit. So hey, overall, everywhere, March over March is down. And you know what? It's almost like we have to go month over month versus uh, uh, year over year. And uh, uh, just because last year you know in the first four or five four months was an anomaly so it like it's it's just it was crazy last year and it's all we're always gonna you know compare you know 10 
twenty percent down, thirty percent down from last year. But but now we're seeing numbers climbing month over month, and I do suspect that there's I do expect to see another spike happening. I think at the end of this month and beginning of May. So there's so if somebody wants to get into the market and sell, I mean sell their house, there's going to be uh, an opportunity there for uh, for you to uh, you know do well on your house based on this year's market. Don't look at last year. And I can tell you a story about uh, uh, that I listed a property at uh, uh, $1,050,000. And uh, my suggested list price was a million dollars. They didn't listen. They wanted to go a million fifty. And, 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 and when you go over that amount, also the down payment's more. But I get an offer for a million dollars. And they signed it back at one million fifty. Now, we were overpriced a little bit at a million dollars. And but mm -hmm. we got the buyers to, to come up to a million dollars on the on the house. My my seller said no, and uh, so they, we lost a buyer. Now we're getting no showings. There is you know, yeah. So it, 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 that that's going to hurt. That's hurt us. One um, last question on the the stats and the average versus the benchmark price, because the average price is always kind of in the news, whether it's on the radio, on TV, in newspapers, whatever the case is. Are there buyers and sellers that kind of have a preconceived notion of what their home's average is? Or are you saying, hey, listen, you know, the average is nice, but what you really want to see is the benchmark price. That's what we should be going on. How, how do you have that discussion? It, 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 it's hard because the, because the average price is always higher than the benchmark price. So, so in their head, they've got a uh, number that they feel – the value is so for instance there was a house on the hamilton mountain that we went to and we said that uh 650,000 was the right number well they had 800,000 in their mind and because sometimes people forget or time goes by so much that they remember a house down the street that sold for 800,000 a year ago and and it's locked in their head but but they don't realize they don't realize how much time has gone by and the market's changed quite a bit. And so they're, when you go there and say, hey, listen, this is what your value of your home is. And they're like, whoa. And I'm going, and then you're showing that. Now you have to show them with a computer. Now every realtor should be showing up at a house with a computer so they can access the information so they can show them, you know, the difference, you know, what sold in the past, you know, 30, 60 and even 90 days is, is, is the most I would go. And just so they can get an understanding of what the market's like. But some people don't accept that. They feel that, hey, my neighbor sold for 800, 850,000. That's what I want. So, uh, you know, and that's why we're getting a lot of expired listings on the system right now is just because people are still uh, locked in with prices based on a year ago. Let's go to, I uh, want to talk a little bit about Niagara and the GTA because there's uh, stats and numbers and stories, anecdotal and, uh, and, and hard facts that are showing um, some interesting things. Number one, in, in the GTA, we have, you know, bidding wars back in some cases and we're seeing those higher and even in some cases above asking kind of scenarios, which, you know, these days is kind of like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how this is happening, but it is. What are your thoughts on that scenario? And then, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Niagara. Yeah, you know what? There's uh, th there's a shortage of homes out there right now, and it seems like the buyers that came back into the marketplace um, are are the ones that you know they have you know their their income and their uh, whatever are adjusted based on the new interest rates and the new prices. So they're the ones that are coming. Uh, uh, buying houses now, the ones that didn't buy last year, they're probably glad now they're back in the market now. Um, but yeah, there's a frenzy going on out there, especially in Toronto. It's happening in Hamilton a, a bit and, and also Niagara. So th there are multiple offers happening on homes. We just had one that we had, I think, nine offers on a house that one uh, Lou on our team had. And um, so people are coming back into the marketplace. But here's the difference they're more cautious the buyers are cautious they're not uh going in 50 a hundred thousand dollars maybe in toronto they are but not in hamilton niagara uh the uh, pricing of houses uh, their their offers are very close uh to each other and and you might get eight offers or nine offers maybe one or two are cash offers with no conditions and, and so so people are being very cautious 
in in how much money they're going even over asking. So uh, people are coming back, but very cautiously coming back. And uh, and 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 again, we're going to be like Rick. I'll tell you, that there's going to be a shortage of homes on this mark uh, in this world, especially in Canada and in Ontario, for a long time. Uh, just because of the fact that uh, a, a lot of builders, uh, you know, kind of aren't building as many as they were before. People are scared to buy uh, a new build because they don't know what the interest rate's going to be when, when that house is finished. So they're saying, hey, I want something ready made now. And then I, I know exactly what my interest rates are. So people want product that is within 90 days of when they're purchasing. They don't want to wait a year for it. They don't want to wait three years for it because who knows what the market's going to be in three years. They want to know, they want to, they want to buy and move in in the market that they're in now. And when it comes to Niagara, it recorded the first monthly price increase overall in March, the first time since April of 2022. So almost a year after the fact, is that a supply issue there? Oh, it is, but there's a huge supply issue in Niagara, especially in Niagara Falls, because uh, it seems like everybody is jumping over the Garden City Skyway Bridge and going straight to Niagara Falls uh, to buy houses. Like, like, like um, St. Catharines has done always well, but there, but Niagara Falls seems to be the like, like the more is values are going up way more faster than they are in St. Catharines. And it's just because Niagara, I don't know what it is, but uh, the GTA people are selling their houses there and moving to Niagara Falls. And, and, they're, and, and, and because there's such a shortage of homes, Chippewa, I'm not, and people, if they don't know what Chippewa, it's like a little, if you have to compare like Hamilton and Stony Creek, it's the same thing. Niagara Falls, Chippewa, it's all part of Niagara, uh, Niagara Falls. And then the going into Stevensville, which is on your way to Fort Erie, is becoming... Uh, a lot of developments happening there. So all these people from the GTA are going there. They're driving the prices up in Niagara Falls. They love Niagara Falls. You know, it's a great little little city. And, uh, and, and it's becoming a, a hub for, a, hub for uh, a lot of GTA uh, buyers are moving in that area. And it's funny. Niagara Falls has changed quite a bit. I, I, you know, I grew up there. And uh, I can't believe uh, like how it's changed so much. I mean, I'm always in Niagara Falls driving. I, you know, my parents, li- my mom lives there, my sisters live there, and uh, I got a lot of cousins. So I get to see Niagara Falls almost on a weekly basis when I'm down there. So I see the changes that are happening. And uh, but yeah, no, Niagara is uh, is gonna and it's gonna continue. Niagara is a, is a great place to buy as an investment properties. Um, and and I was just. And I was just telling somebody this. So one of my properties that I bought uh, when I was 19, 20 years old in Niagara Falls was 34000 So now, Rick, if you double 34000 every 10, uh, no, double 34000 and, and you double that, let's say 1985 to, 2000, uh, to uh, 1995, 1995 to 2005, 2005, 2015, right? And then 2025, if you, I think it, I think it should work out to 544,000. Well, it sold in 2021 for 500,000. This one house I purchased at 34,000. Now, if you work the math, double, you know, start at 34,000, double that, double that number again right up until 2025, which is 2 years away from now, it landed ex- almost pretty close to the doubling of every 10 years. Wow. So, like, I just, I just, I can't believe it. I'm going to be doing a, a little video on that. I'm going to be standing in front of the house. I was going to say, I bought this house way back, and here's where it is now. And, and there was also another house in the west end of Hamilton. These people bought it for 500, around 500000 in 2013. We just sold it for uh, just, just, just a little over a million dollars in 2023. It doubled. <laughs> See? I'm telling you. So you shouldn't worry about... You know, if it's 5000 2000 you know, try to make that deal because I'll tell you, you will double the, the, the value of the property. Plus, in 10 years, you've, uh, you've brought down your mortgage uh, by a quite a bit of a percentage just from making the payments for the last 10 years on your house. Absolutely. Uh, to uh, the uh, luxury market, and, and speaking of bidding, war, bidding wars, there seems to be one when it comes to these luxury homes. The 2023 Spotlight on Luxury report from Remax Canada shows that between the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first quarter of this year, 
Um, yeah, Remax reported increased activity in nine of the 15 markets. And the one that saw the most significant jump was Hamilton Burlington, spiking by nearly 40%, 38.7% quarter to quarter. What's the luxury market like right now? It is jumping, and that's what's offsetting the average sell price. That's what's bumping the average sell price up <laughs> versus the benchmark price. So that's that, that's you know, so that's what's messing things up. But a lot of these homes, uh, so we're finding there's two sellers in this in, in this luxury luxury market. We're we're finding sellers that now are ready to move out of their luxury home, and people are buying. But we're also finding that uh, like that lived in their houses a long time. But we're also finding that a lot of luxury buyer sellers right now, they bought in the last two, three years and they're putting their house up for sale. Maybe they can't afford it because of the interest rates, but we're finding that, uh, but the buyers are coming in. More luxury homes are selling. There was, so I looked at the history of a lot of these luxury homes. A lot of these people were trying to sell these in the last couple of years and they were struggling and now they're selling. And, and a lot of these people have bought in, a lot, in two and a half, three, four years ago, and they're selling. So they're only staying in there a short term, not, not sure what the reasons are, but they are putting them up for sale and selling them. So, and I found a lot of them were expired. Uh, they tried and tried and tried for a year or so to sell these luxury homes, and they couldn't, but now they're finally selling. So the market has changed, especially in the, uh, in the, in the Hamilton area, just because of the fact that it's, it's affordable. I mean, it's still a great price uh, in the area compared to the GTA, Burlington, and, 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 and Niagara, also the same thing is going on. So, uh, There is something new on the market, relatively new. I've, I've heard about it for at least a few weeks, but uh, certainly new to Canada. I'm not sure it's even here yet, and it's called Boxable. These are tiny, basically pre-made homes that you pick a you know, landing spot for this home, they unfold it, and lo and behold, you have you have a place to stay. What do you think of this idea? Could this potentially alleviate the housing supply crisis we have in this country? I think they may not have a choice. This is a company that's come out with this, and I think they are going to explode, and they won't be able to keep up to the demand on this. This is kind of some something similar to... Um, after World War II happened, uh, they started building these, they needed to build homes for these people coming home from the war because they were starting families and everything. So they started building, uh, uh, they called them wartime houses. They didn't have basements, crawl spaces. They just built these small houses, maybe had two bedrooms, um, and uh, they, were, they put them up quick and, and on these nice properties, and, they were, and people moved in. So, and, and that's what this is kind of going to be like because there's it's hard you could build these houses in the plant I th I'm not sure how many they can build in an hour they said I think they said I, one or two in an hour that can come off the assembly line pretty well as they're, as they're saying but there these are going to be the new wartime houses and they're going to go in subdivisions they're going to go in back in the back of people's properties that have the extra room to build to put back there um, and and they could put these up less than a day. Like in a, in a few hours, they just got to uh, screw in the kitchen, the plumbing, uh, toilet, and they're all set. So if you look at it, if you look at the video on these things, it's it's incredible. And I think my understanding is is Elon Musk is part of part of this thing that they come up with, and yeah. and and the and the U.S. government has ordered a lot of these box uh, boxable houses uh, for I'm not sure what you know maybe for army bases and stuff like that, but. I think I think they're going to become more and more popular as time goes on. Yeah, you mentioned Elon Musk. He he purchased one, I believe, for his SpaceX uh, complex, basically. And and you know, if he's investing in something like this, you know, it, it probably has some legs. But you mentioned it does not take long at all for one of these homes to be installed. Just picture a twenty by twenty structure that comes in a shipping container. They haul it out. It unfolds. They place it basically wherever you want. It has a fully functioned kitchen, bathroom, HVAC system, and, and this thing un unloads and unfolds in about an hour. And then, you know, you do some fine tuning in that. But this could be a game changer. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? And this, this is what we're going to need because um, it'll be affordable. 
for the new generation coming in. It's the, it's the stepping stone to get into owning uh, home ownership. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it, and, and now we have places to live. Like there's a million people coming into Canada, I think within a year or, uh, based on, you know, that what's happening We're our population's growing and we're not building enough houses to accommodate this. So this is going to become something that, uh, the government's going to work with developers and say, Hey, listen. If you put these box, boxable houses in this subdivision, well, developers don't even have to do it because they don't have to build because they're already built. They just got to put them on platforms on, on probably on pads of uh, concrete pads and then and they're set to go on these little small properties. You got a little driveway, a little backyard, and uh, you're good to go. The only thing I haven't seen is the cost, but if anyone is listening right now thinking, oh, 20 by 20 room, I don't want to live in something that small. Just think of Lego. And these boxable units, there's there's 20 by 30, 20 by 20, 20 by 40, 20 by 60 uh, rooms, basically, that you can configure, stack, uh, connect, w- whatever, and build a house of your dreams. Perhaps this is a very fascinating development. We'll, we'll keep our eye on this for sure. Uh, really interesting poll from Ipsos. Uh, they did a poll of uh, Canadians who don't own a home and, and those who do. And, and some of the results are really interesting. So this poll shows that 63% of Canadians who don't currently own a home have given up on the idea of ever becoming a home owner. And it, it goes through by demographics, whether you're Gen Z or you're a boomer in terms of co-ownership. And not many boomers are feeling the love in that category, but certainly if you're in Gen Z, you're thinking of co-ownership. But even uh, when it comes to Canadians thinking about, is home ownership affordable? A lot of Canadians thinking, oh, you got to be rich these days to afford a home. What are your thoughts on some of the numbers and the stats that you're seeing and hearing about in this poll? Yeah, I I believe that those numbers are, are, I'm not going to say they're accurate, but I do believe a lot of uh, Canadians have given up. And they just, the, the way this market has been in the last five years is played a lot of mind games on people you know they, they just starting to save money and they're just and they thought they were so close to putting a, a a purchase in and then all of a sudden uh housing prices go up then and then uh now they're, they're, they're out of it then now housing prices are coming down so they thought okay here's my chance to get in but interest rates go up it's just it's just been a roller coaster ride and uh and for the for the c- c- average canadian if if basically it's it, it is they've given up and and i get it like it's a struggle and, it, and you know what it is and the struggle is when you purchase a home i mean your your mortgage will be more than what your your uh, rent would be but but if you can buy something and, and rent the basement out and stuff like that that there's the opportunity there but it is becoming difficult it's now that market's picking back up again and again they're looking at it and say oh you know now i gotta you know compete against it because if I'm trying to find a house that's under 500,000 there's you know a lot of buyers looking at it it is becoming difficult and and uh, and I and I see that um, I I think based on my generation of home ownership versus the next generation and the, and the generation after that as they go into the retirement you are probably not going to see as many people own homes as they as they do uh, as my parents' generation and my generation. And it just depends on, unless something changes. But as long as they keep bringing people into this country and people are coming in and they're buying houses within two to three years of immigration. So they're renting for a short bit and boom, and they're, and they're saving their money. And, and immigrants are great at saving money. They, like, I mean, they basically live on, on next to nothing. They're not wasting any money. They're not buying Gucci purses. They're not, you know buying expensive cars you know they're riding their bikes to work and they're not not buying so so money if they're bringing home a paycheck of eight hundred dollars a week they're only spending maybe a hundred of that a hundred and the other and the and the seven hundred is going into a savings because they want to buy a house and they want to buy a house fast there's a couple of other uh, stats that I want to get your opinion on. Number one, and, and it's really interesting stuff because the findings show that 76% of respondents feel that owning a home was the best investment a person can make. And I think most people would agree with that. Yeah. But on the flip side, 71% said that high interest rates were keeping them on the sideline of the housing market. And three in 10, so 30% said they believe now was a good time 
for a first home purchase. So while interest rates are high and while they know it's a good investment, they're not making the jump, which makes me think because of inflation and, and high interest rates and the cost of living going up, is the bank of mom and dad tapped out at this point? Yeah, I think pretty. I, I'm I'm pretty sure it is pretty well, and uh, and it and and they just lost hope, right? It's easier, it's easier to give up than it is to keep fighting and trying to save it and and trying to purchase that property. Um, I get, you know, I get it. The bank of mom and dad uh, was huge in the last couple of years, but I I don't see it as much now as I did. Uh, two years ago or or even three years ago but i i do see it, it it has changed so pretty well anybody that buying a house they're on their own they 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 got to figure out on their own so it's 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 a tough go out there and uh and you know they're doing everything they can but it's uh it you know it's as inflation goes up and interest rates go up and now housing prices are starting to climb a little bit back up again it's, it's becoming more difficult so the uh, provincial government is trying its darndest to help renters in Ontario. It says it's going to invest millions of dollars, six and a half million dollars to hire 40 additional adjudicators to the landlord and tenant board, all in an effort to clear this massive backlog of tribunal cases that have erupted during the last, well, the the three years that we've been in the pandemic between landlords and tenants and providing some additional measures to protect against so-called rent evictions, where uh, a tenant will get booted from an apartment the landlord will renovate it and then re-rent it for a much higher rate. Just on the backlog, uh, obviously more people are going to help the cause. How long do you think this is going to take? Um, to get these people, I don't know. I think it's going to take them uh, four to six months maybe before uh, things like this happen. And, and, and it is true that there is a lot of uh, landlords that did uh, have uh, uh, – tenants move out because they are renovating either their apartment building or their house or whatever. And, and, and land and tenants, I mean, they were in a tough situation. They ended up having a lot, a lot of them ended up having to, to move to uh, apartments, especially if they were in townhouses or single family homes uh, because it was hard to find um, a rent the same, so they ended up having to go into apartments because there's a lot of tenants out there that've been in their houses 10, 20, even 30 years, and they're only paying. Mm-hmm. Let's say, let's say, let's say you have a, a single family home, and they're only paying, let's say, a twelve hundred dollars a month. A, a, a landlord can get probably twenty four hundred to twenty seven hundred dollars a month on that same property. So what they're trying to do is say, hey, I want to sell this, or I want to, I want to uh, uh, update this because I, I can't get financing because the fi- because the rent's so low. So they try to, you know, fix up the property and uh, and and basically maybe hopefully they can re-rent it to somebody else for for more money. So a lot of tenants got kicked out because of this situation, and especially in apartment buildings. And I I know of people that came in, especially from the GTA, coming in, buying these apartment buildings cheap in Hamilton, and then uh, they kicked the tenants out, renovated it, and re-rented them out, and resold the apartment building at a higher rent, so they, they uh, eva- the, the apartment building became more valuable and went up in price just because of, of the, the renovations and, and the income of the rent was higher. So, is that, I, I think it'll, it'll, it will be tougher coming up, people wanting to uh, vac- uh, uh, let the tenants out and uh, renovate and because uh, and, they have the right to come back. They'll make sure that, or they can get fined if they don't allow them back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the stipulations is if the landlord intends to raise the unit's price following the renovation, the tenant has either two years after moving out or six months after the renovations are complete, whichever is longer, to file with the landlord and tenant board for a remedy. So at least they're at least they're making some headway to not only clear the backlog, but maybe give some protections to both landlord and tenant. So that's a pretty good uh, scenario. Let's uh, cap off the show with Italy. Uh, and it is apparently a hot spot for real estate investment. And one of the reasons that uh, this article, at least that we're looking at, points to is uh, the opportunity to obtain Italian dual citizenship. So yeah, it sounds kind of cool. You invest in some real estate and you, and you get dual citizenship. Sounds like a win-win. Absolutely. I couldn't believe this. Italy was, uh, you know, one of the hot spots of uh, putting money in. I, I believe that. Uh, I mean, Italy is probably one of the top two or three countries most visited in the world by tourists. So so I, mm-hmm. I, I, I get that. And I know uh, Italy does want uh, investments into uh, in their country because there's a lot of small villages 
in uh, towns that are becoming uh, abandoned because of, you know, the younger generation uh, are moving out and the older generation's passing away. And uh, so they're, they're, make, they're doing everything they can to, to bring in investors to, uh, to buy real estate there and maybe, you know, Airbnb it out or, or, or whatever. But there is, so, there, there is a lot of opportunities in Italy. And, uh, and I know they're even trying to sell, uh, I, I know in Sicily, there was a, a program where they would actually, you could buy a, a house for a thousand. You just got to pay the taxes, renovate it and stuff like that. They, mm-hmm. cause they want to keep these little villages and towns, uh, hopping and happening. It's like my dad's village where he came from. I mean, at, at the height in the, in, uh, there were 700 people living in this village right now. There's only a hundred, you know what I mean? So what's like, who's occupying all those residences, right? Like, you know, there's, you know, so, so again, you know, that this is an opportunity for people to have a piece of, uh, have, uh, citizenship in Italy if they want. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I would not uh, blink an eye if I had a chance to get a home in Italy. And who knows, maybe sometime soon. Uh, Rob, a uh, great show as always. Don't forget, you can listen to our show online through Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and many more. Just search for the Golfy Real Estate Show in your favorite podcast platform. Hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the rest of the Easter weekend. And thank you for listening to the Golfy Real Estate Show. We are back next Saturday at 9 on 900 CHML.